Mm, pretty. Variegated leaves. There were over 60 flower pictures submitted for this, so we had quite a variety from, from our temple members. I love the ones with the personal touches, the children or their little pets in there. Oh. The uh, drawing of this flower was very clever too. Oh, the plumerias remind me of Hawaii. Oh. <laughs> it's only a few of us commenting. Oh, where was this? Very nice stand of wisteria. I don't know whose it was, but Sumi Yanagihara usually brings some in for the Hanamido. Uh huh. That one with the head of the Buddha, I think, was that the um, temple kitchen? What is this? This is lovely. That's an epiphyllum there. The previous one were apple blossoms. A apple blossom? I see. Yeah. Thank you. The epiphyllum are so showy, so beautiful. Those roses? Mm hmm They're a thornless climbing rose. From your uh, house, uh, Katie? Yeah. And look at that one. Wow, so unusual. <laughs> Who drew the flowers? The kids or, or an artist? Oh, look at that one. Those Love. were Juliana's drawings. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> These roses are beautiful. Hmm, look at that. Wow, nice photography. That's a, oh, it's a painting, wow. Yeah, that was uh, one of Linda Redenbaugh's paintings she submitted. Really? This is pretty. Oh, the, um, Orcas that went to the Kato Kai. Oh, the ones that were brought to um, my auntie, and then I saw the ones brought to um, Laverne's mom, Gladys. They're, they're so gorgeous. Wow. Mm. Nice. This is kind of like the fireworks um, at 4th of July. Everybody goes, ooh and ah. I mean, they just can't help themselves. Oh, wow. Botanical building, I think. In the, mm -hmm. the I recognize, in yeah. So gorgeous, so. That's inside. Oh, is this from um, the family who donated the flower? Oh, those orchids. Wow. No, I think that was inside the botanical building. Oh, oh, okay. This one's so cute. Whose yard is this? I think those were from, with the doggies and the dog statue were from Nancy Martinez's yard. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's a beautiful statue. Oh, and this one. Is this is this uh, the one in Kamakura? The Daibutsu? Hawaii. That statue was in Hawaii? Wow. Yes. Hachi. Oh, that's pretty. Is this a poppy? It's so pretty. Mm, pretty. Oh, a 
of the flower field. Wow. What do you think those were? The pink? That's flower brush. Uh, yes, the pink. Oh. The whole showy. Oh, pretty. I don't know. That pink bush is growing on the corner of my yard. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. It, it came with the house 18 years ago. <laughs> the lovely plumerias. Oh, look at that. Oh, Ken put it in, Indian hawthorn. Uh, you mean those flowers that... Pink one. Medis yard? Oh, nice. Oh, look at that. Was that in the office too? This orchid? Green, this is Ann on. That's my office. When I started my new job, Chris Tokunaga gave me those orchids. Oh, nice. <laughs> Tulips look like fire. Hey, this has come in so many colors and variety. It's amazing. Plumeria too. It's a nice stand of wisteria, the way it's shaped. Whose yard is this from? Does anybody know the name of these lilies? Uh, Kepper lilies. What's that? Kepper lilies. They, we have them in front of the temple, too. Oh, okay. I, I have them in my yard, and I want to look up how to um, take care of them. Ke Kepper. They're, they're mostly uh, a shade plant. Uh-huh. Nice artist. Hi, Jason. Hi, Juliana. Wow. Hey, we're going to begin the uh, service shortly, I think. Um, Thanks, Smitty. That was lovely. I do appreciate everybody uh, joining us already. We might have some more stragglers come in as the service gets started. So welcome to our Zoom Hanamatsuri service, the observance of Shakyamuni Buddha's birthday. Since we were unable to decorate the Onaijin and build a Hanamido this year, we've substituted a virtual flower display. And I hope you logged in early enough to enjoy some of the beautiful flower photos that were shared by many members of our temple. The uh, flowers certainly are a sign and symbol of spring, but as Buddhists, they also commemorate the birthplace of the Buddha in a garden of magnificent blossoms. Shakyamuni Buddha, the founder of Buddhism, was born on April 8th, more than 2,600 years ago. And this is a day for gratitude and appreciation to the historical Buddha for leaving us the wonderful teachings of the Dharma, and as Shin Buddhists, for his appearance in this world, which enabled us to encounter the teachings of Amida Buddha's primal vow. Shinran Shonen, the founder of Jodo Shinshu Buddhism, teaches us about the reason for Shakyamuni Buddha's birth and appearance in our world through his masterwork, Kyogyo Shinsho, or the true teaching, practice, and realization of the Pure Land Way. Shinran tells us that Shakyamuni Buddha appeared in this world 
not only to expound the teachings of the way to awakening that would lead us out of samsara, but more specifically, Shakyamuni was born into human form so that he could deliver the sermons or sutras on the all-encompassing vows of Amida Buddha. As Shin Buddhists, we celebrate Hanamatsuri, commemorating the birth of Shakyamuni Buddha, who manifested in order that we might learn of the infinite light and immeasurable life that is Amida Buddha. Our officiant for today's Hanamatsuri service is Reverend Dr. Kenji Akahoshi, and our guest speaker is Sensei Koichi Mizushima. Since we are gathering on Zoom, I'd like to remind everyone that you are invited to chant and sing during the service as the words will be provided for you on the screen, but please remain on mute as a courtesy to others. We will now begin the service with the ringing of the concho or the calling bell, inviting all of us to be present and listen to the Dharma. ガコンタンモクショニョライガコンカンクモクショニョライジョウチショウゴクドクシュゴジョクシュジョリクドショニョライジョウホウシン
gathered here today to commemorate the birth of Siddhartha Gautama, who became Shakyamuni Buddha. It is with a sense of indebtedness, reverence, and gratitude that we acknowledge his great contribution to humanity. His teachings of the larger sutra has provided us with the path of the Nembutsu, which provides a refuge from adversities and an affirmation of oneness. We express our deepest appreciation of wisdom and compassion as we recite the Nembutsu. Kasho Namo Amidabuts. Namo Amidabuts. Namo Amidabuts. Namo Amidabuts. Namo Amidabuts. Namo Shigan Fu Manzo Se Fu Jo Shoga A O Mu Yo Ho Fu Yi Dai Se Shu Fu Sai Sho Bing Gu Se Fu Jo Shoga Gashi jo butsu do, nyo sho cho ji po, u kyo mi sho mon, se fu jo sho ga. Ri yoku jin sho nen, jo e shu bong gyo, しぐむじょうど I he chi again, a she con mo an, a so ku show a ku do, to dan zen shu mon. Ko so jo man zo, e yo ro di po. Nichi gotten shu do ki Ketten ko on pu gen I shu kai ho zo Ko se ku doku ho Jo o 
Dai Shu Chu Seppo Shi Shi Ku Ku Yo Isai But Gu Soku Shu Toku Hon Gan Ne Shi Tsu Jou Man Toku I Sangai Yo Yo Gut Mu Ge Chi だにぷしょ Treasures. Hard is it to be born into human life, 
now we are living it. Difficult is it to hear the teachings of the Blessed One. Now we hear it. If we do not deliver ourselves in the present life, no hope is there that we shall be freed from suffering and sorrow in the ocean of birth and death. Let us reverently take refuge in the three treasures of the truth. I take refuge in Buddha. May we all together absorb into ourselves the principle of your way to enlightenment and awaken in ourselves our supreme will. I take refuge in Dharma. May we all together be submerged in the depth of the doctrine and gain wisdom as deep as the ocean. I take refuge in Sangha. May we all together become units in true accord in your life of harmony in a spirit of universal brotherhood, freed from the bondage of selfishness. Even through ages of myriads of kalpas, hard is it to hear such an excellent, profound, and wonderful doctrine. Now we are able to hear and receive it. Let us thoroughly understand the true meaning of Tathagata's teachings. Basho, namo idabutsu, namo idabutsu, namo idabutsu. Good morning. For our Hanamatsuki service, we have as our guest speaker, Mr. Koichi Mizushima Sensei. He is a minister's assistant at the Sacramento Best Wing and has been since 2003. He's been a very active member of the Sacramento Best Wing as their program director. He has also served as a Dharma school teacher. He's been active at the BCA as the BCA youth coordinator since 2018. And he's a staff member at the BCA Center for Buddhist Education, CDE, on staff. And that's the group that puts all those very good programs on, usually on Saturdays. He's co-owned several Japanese restaurants in Sacramento. And I could recall meeting uh, Koichi many years ago, probably about 20 years ago, at a Dharma school conference in Sacramento. At the time, I thought he was a young college student, and yet he was an owner of a restaurant. He's an excellent speaker, uh, very talented and entertaining. Our speaker comes from a very talented family. I know his father sings and plays instruments, and he does so himself. He and his daughter Ellie has put together some videos that you can see on YouTube, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it as uh, a couple of them are very hilarious. So I'm sure you'll enjoy his talk both to the Dharma school and to our adults. Thank you, Koichi. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it is such an honor and a great pleasure to be here today uh, with all of you here at the San Diego Buddhist Church. Um, you know, San Diego actually was one of the last places that I was able to visit before the entire pandemic hit. So this was last year. And I remember, I think it was March 7th, back in 2020, uh, my daughter and I were so fortunate that we got to come visit the San Diego Temple. And we attended the, I think it was the Southern District uh, Junior YBA event. Um, I, I hope Jenna's there. Uh, Jenna was one of the people that were there leading it and Sarah Matsumoto. Anyway, we had such a lovely, lovely time in San Diego. And sadly, that was the last in-person temple event that I ever attended before the pandemic. So it is so actually very, very emotional and, and, and wonderful to be back here today over one year later to be able to share a wonderful Hanamatsuri Dharma message with all of you. So it is wonderful to be virtually back in San Diego, even though I'm not physically with you now. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, Reverend Akahoshi Sensei for inviting me. Uh, I think he actually invited me to speak a year ago, but uh, due to everything closed down, uh, we were not able to join with you until now. So thank you so much, Sensei, for, for inviting me back. It is such a wonderful pleasure and honor to be here. Okay, so everyone knows why we are here today. Not, not just for regular Sunday service, but what makes this Sunday service special and important for us uh, Buddhists, right? And I think all of you know, I'm sure they mentioned it already in the introduction that it is Hanamatsuri. Hanamatsuri. Hanamatsuri means flower festival. And this is why we 
make the, um, you know, the little flower, uh, you know, setup that we do, um, all those wonderful things that we set up in celebration. And we put the statue of the Buddha there with the symbolic pouring of the, the sweet tea. And so we're going to talk a little bit today about what Hanamatsuri means and what it is. And of course, you all know already, it's the Buddha's birthday. So, you know, I had a very special friend come visit me today. So let's bring him out. Um, hey, will you, will you come out here? <laughs> hey, it's me, Elmo. Elmo, we're so happy to see you here today, Elmo. <laughs> yeah. All right, Elmo. So do you know why we're here today? Uh, yeah. We're here for Hanamatsuri. That's right, Hanamatsuri. And that is, of course, the historical Buddha's birthday, right? Shakyamuni Buddha's birthday. Yeah. Okay, so Elmo, do you know the story of the Buddha? Do you know? A uh, little bit. Okay. So let me tell you the story about the Buddha. Okay, would you like to hear that? Yeah. Okay, great. So most of us know that the Buddha was uh, born over 2,500 years ago, almost 2,600 years ago, in um, the city of Kapilavastu. Kapilavastu. That's right. That's right. And uh, do you know uh, the name of the king and the queen of the city at that time, the king and the queen of the Shakya clan? Uh, king Sudodana. That's right. And queen that's right. So there was a king and queen. The king was named King Sudodana and Queen Maya. Mm -hmm. And for many years, they wished to have a child. They wanted a child. And one day, they were very fortunate, and they finally got pregnant. The queen got pregnant. Queen Maya. That's right. Queen Maya got pregnant. So back in those days, uh, when when a queen like that uh, would be expecting a child, she would traditionally deliver the child back in her hometown. Oh. Yes. So the king and the queen, they loaded up all of their, their things and prepared for this long trip back to the queen's home village. Okay. So on the way to the village, the queen decided to stop for a rest. Do you remember where they stopped? Uh, no, no. Okay. They stopped in Lumbini Garden. Lumbini Garden. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard that. I'm sure we even have a, a gatha, right? One of the songs that's titled In Lumbini Garden. Um, have you remember that now? Oh, yeah, yeah. Lumbini Garden. Lumbini Garden. That's right. That's right. But... Some people call it Lumbini's Garden. Yeah? But it's not Lumbini's Garden. There wasn't a person named Lumbini whose garden it was. Lumbini was actually a place. So it's Lumbini Garden. Kind of like Madison Square Garden, right? Uh, that famous uh, place that they hold concerts and boxing matches, all kinds of events. It's not Madison's Square Garden, right? It's Madison Square Garden. So that's kind of how Lumbini Garden is. Okay. Yes. So, <coughs> after um, the son was born in Lumbini Garden, right? They, they were so happy. They were so grateful. And they named the son. Do you remember what they named him when he was first born? Uh, <gasps> yeah. What was his name? Siddhartha. That's right. They named him Siddhartha. Siddhartha. Yeah. Okay. Do you know what Siddhartha means when you translate the word Siddhartha? Uh, no, no. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. So one translation of the name Siddhartha is every wish fulfilled. Every wish fulfilled. <sighs> yes, that is a pretty heavy and important thing, right? Can you imagine if when you were born uh, that your parents said, you are my 
every single wish fulfilled, everything in the world, everything in the life that I could have ever wished for is all within you. That's a lot of pressure, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. I know, I know. It's a lot of pressure. Um, so from a very young age, Siddhartha was being groomed. The king wanted him to take over the kingdom. That's why he wanted a child in the first place, especially a son, right? So when Siddhartha was born, there was a kind of a, they call him a soothsayer. Soothsayer. Okay, yes. He was kind of like a fortune teller in a way. And he came to the king and he told the king and the queen and he said, I have a vision, a vision in my mind of what your son will become, all right? And the king said, share with me this great vision, share with me, right? So the soothsayer told the king that I foresee your son Siddhartha will become one of two things, one of two things. He will either become a great warrior king, much like yourself, or he will become a great spiritual leader. Ah, yes, yes. So what do you think the king wanted Siddhartha to become? What do you think the king wanted him to become? Probably a king like him. That's right. So the king really, really wished Siddhartha would become a great warrior king just like him. So you know what the king did? No. The king, <laughs> here, let me tell you what the king did. The king actually created the first quarantine ever. I mean, we thought we were in quarantine here. Yeah, it was, it's pretty bad. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people suffered during this time. But same thing, King Sudanana created the first quarantine ever for Siddhartha. He instructed everyone in the kingdom to never let Siddhartha leave the four walls of the palace. He never let him leave. But his hope was he wanted Siddhartha to think life within the palace was so wonderful and so luxurious and so complete that Siddhartha would never wish to leave the kingdom and never wish to pursue anything else in his life. So that's why the king did that. Oh. So Siddhartha had all the finest clothes, all the finest food, all the finest beds, and he got to play his sports and he got to go to his schools, his teachers would come and everything. And they even kept everything away from him that was any type of suffering at all. So Siddhartha led the, well, what he thought, what the king thought anyway, the perfect life. But it probably wasn't perfect, was it? No, I want to go outside. That's true, that's true. So eventually Siddhartha was able to even find a wife and he married his wife, Yasodhara. Yasodhara. That's right, Yasodhara. And Siddhartha had a son, and he named his son Rahula. Rahula! Yes, Rahula. Do you know what Rahula means? No. Okay, Rahula literally translates as, mm, I've seen it written as fetter. And a fetter is kind of a chain that you chain prisoners with. So it's something that kind of change you up, right? I've also heard Rahula translated as attachment, like an attachment. Oh, that does not sound very good. I know, especially because that's his son. You would think that it would be a happy thing. And of course he was happy to have a healthy son. However, when his son was born and he married his wife, Siddhartha realized at that time that this was going to be his life forever. He knew that he would eventually grow up, become the king, take over the kingdom, and he would have to raise his son to become the king to grow up and take over the kingdom after him. So this is kind of why Siddhartha felt that this was such an attachment, kind of like chaining him down. And this is where 
he first asked his chariot driver. Um, I think his name was Chana. Chana! Yes. Do you know what a chariot is? Uh, no. A chariot, it was kind of like a, um, it was a horse that uh, pulled this uh, kind of a cart. It was like a vehicle, right, that they would ride in. So Siddhartha asked Chana to take him outside of the palace walls for the first time ever. And this is the story of the four gates. So Siddhartha first went out and he went out of the east gate. And what did he see? Oh, I remember, I remember. What did he see? <gasps> he saw an old man. That's right. This is how much the king protected Siddhartha. He never even saw an old person before. So when Siddhartha first saw this old man, he said, what's wrong with that man, Chana? And Chana said, nothing, my lord. That person is merely old. Oh, Oops, I moved the wrong mouth. I, I was talking. Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he said, oh, oh, right, right. So he saw this old man and he says, Chana, will that happen to me too? And Chana said, yes, my Lord, that too shall happen to you one day. So the next day he went out of the Southern gate and he saw a sick man. And Siddhartha was so worried that he saw this man coughing and looking sick. And he said, Chana, what is this? And Chana said, that is a sick person. And Siddhartha said, well, that happened to me too. And Chana said, yes. And then he went out of the Western gate and he saw a funeral. Oh, a funeral. Yes. And he said, Chana, what is wrong with that person? And Chana said, that person has passed away. And that is a funeral. And Siddhartha said, will that happen to me too? And Chana said, yes, yes, of course. You too, my Lord, that will happen to you. And on the last and final gate, which is the North Gate, Siddhartha went out and he saw a, a, a holy man, kind of like an enlightened being. We don't know if it was a Buddha exactly or an enlightened being, but he saw this person of great spiritual, just an aura and an energy came off of him. And it impressed Siddhartha so much that he asked Chana, what is that? And Chana said, that is a holy person. That is a spiritual person, spiritual man. And Siddhartha said, is that something I can become? And Chana said, well, maybe if you pursued it and studied hard. And that really got Siddhartha's mind going. So probably many days or weeks after that, he had that experience he made the decision to leave his family, leave his palace, leave his wealth, leave everything, leave his quarantine. And at the age of 29, he left the palace. And for six long years, Siddhartha studied with only his monk robes and a begging bowl. And he led the life of an ascetic monk, very strict life. Only ate one grain of rice a day. He fasted, he studied, he meditated for six long years. Legend has it that he was so skinny, you could see his backbone through the front of his body. But at the end of the six years, Siddhartha was no closer to finding the answers in his life that he was looking for. He could not find the meaning of his life. And one day, a young maiden came out from be between the trees and offered him a bowl of rice porridge. I like rice porridge. Yeah, I'm sure you do. And Siddhartha ate the porridge. And a lot of the people that were following him said, oh, you're not the devout ascetic monk that we thought you were. You were not as strong as we thought you were. You're eating the porridge. You are weak. But Siddhartha realized in that moment that suffering in this way, studying this hard and doing all of this to his body and mind and soul was not how to find the answer. So when he ate the porridge, he sat beneath the tree. What kind of tree? Bodhi, Bodhi. Yes, the Bodhi tree. Sat underneath the tree, meditated, and the next day he awoke an enlightened being. And from that day forth, he was known as the Shakamuni Buddha. Muni means wise one. Shaka is his clan name, his family name, the Shaka clan. And Buddha means one who is awake. So he is the wise one from the Shakya clan who is now awake. And that is the story of the Buddha. And that is what we're celebrating today for Hanamatsuri, the birthday of the Buddha. Oh, so what did he learn when he became enlightened? Ha, 
Good question. Good question. Now, this is something that none of you have ever seen before. No one knows the secret of life, but Siddhartha, when he became the Shakyamuni Buddha, discovered the secret to all of life. And here's the teaching. And this is something I'm going to share with you and all of you, only in San Diego. I haven't even shared this anywhere else yet. This is the first time. The answers that you've never heard before. This is what the Shakyamuni Buddha discovered when he became enlightened. You ready? Here it is. He discovered... Okay, I'm totally kidding. I'm totally kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry I did that. I'm sorry I did that. I'm sure you were all waiting at the edge of your seats, children. Um, but no, in Buddhism, there is no magic answer, right? There is no secret. There is no one teaching that will solve all of your suffering. And that is the Buddha's greatest lesson of his life. Through all of the experiences he had, through all of the strict study and practice, through all of the suffering he endured, through all of the things he left behind, the Buddha's greatest lesson was that you cannot live one extreme or the other. You cannot live the, the total spoiled and privileged life of a wealthy and powerful prince to a kingdom. And you can also not live as a poor, homeless, and, and poor ascetic monk starving your body almost to the brink of death. This is the Shakyamuni Buddha's greatest awakening and lesson. Life isn't any extreme and there is no magic answer. So finally, the Buddha found his peace when he lived his life of middle path and he lived his life of a reasonable human life. And that's how he came to his enlightenment. And that is the message that he shared with all of the people all across the land, rich and poor, old and young. He shared this message with everyone. And this is why we celebrate Hanumatsuri. It is such an important day because without the Buddha, we would not have these amazing teachings. So i like to thank Elmo for joining me today. He had to, he had to leave early and go home. But we wanted to thank Elmo, and I wanted to thank all of you um, children for attending today's morning service. Please join me in Gassho. Namo Amida Butsu. 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 Namo At this time, Dharma School students and teachers will head to their Zoom breakout rooms to participate in the special craft project. All others, please stay right where you are, and our Hanamatsuri service will continue momentarily. Back again, this time with the Hanamatsuri Dharma message with Sensei Koichi Mizushima. Uh, welcome back again. Uh, I think the children have probably been excused to their Dharma school classes. So uh, let's let's uh, just talk to the adults here. Um, you all just heard me tell the story of uh, Hanamatsuri to our good friend Elmo. And I'm sure you all know the story already. Um, everybody knows the story very well. And as adults, though, we understand that this is a very old story, a 2,600-year-old story almost, right? And we know that it is woven in with a bit of folklore, 
a bit of legend. We don't take it 100% literally, right? Because some of this uh, birth story talks about uh, when, when Siddhartha was first born, he took seven steps and pointed to the heavens and the earth down below. So we don't take that literally, right? Because <laughs> every parent knows that, uh, yeah, well, everyone knows that, that newborn babies just don't do that. However, to me, the most compelling thing about the Shakyamuni Buddha, um, not just his teachings, right? That's, that was obviously life-changing and world-shaping. But to me, what was most compelling and interesting about the Buddha was his willingness to share his enlightenment with anyone and everyone. Now, today, this doesn't sound like that big of, an, a, big of a deal, right? Um, you know, we share things with as many people that will listen right now. We'll, we'll get all the views we can, right? All the like clicks and everything, right? But remember, go back in time thousands of years ago. And remember, this was a... It was a homogeneous uh, society, meaning there, was, there weren't different uh, ethnic backgrounds because they were all in India. They were all Indian at the time. But despite the fact that they were all one culture, all one ethnic background that they shared, there were still very, very distinct class systems, right? There were caste systems in place. And things like education, especially even religion, these were not things that were enjoyed by the people in a lower caste system or in an uneducated caste system. This was only reserved for the wealthy, the elite, the powerful. So the fact that when he became the Shakyamuni Buddha and he was willing to share this amazing enlightenment that he experienced, share it with everyone and anyone that would listen, this was groundbreaking at the time. And to me, that is one of the most important parts of the story, almost as important as the Enlightenment itself. So this is a big thing, okay? And uh, this is maybe one of the reasons why these Buddhist teachings spread from India and all across the continent, eventually into China and then in, in all the way to Japan over the ocean. That was probably a big reason why these teachings spread. There were there was a lot of other teachings uh, that that were there at the time, uh, but those didn't spread to the same degree that this did across all the continents. And maybe it was because it was rooted in the fact that it was a teaching for everyone, and a lot of it was done orally, right? Because, again, just to reiterate the point that a lot of the lower caste people, they were not, uh, they couldn't read and write. So a lot of these traditions were shared orally and shared by word of mouth. And that's how they were able to spread. But as you know, anytime something new starts to take hold, anytime a large shift occurs, especially within a society as structured as that was at the time, the people in power, the people that were in the highest castes, probably looked upon it with a great deal of fear and skepticism, right? They don't want their lower castes of people to be liberated and, and, and free thinking and change the way things have been done, right? So with that fear, you know, people weren't on board with the ideas. Um, they weren't in sync. They weren't in tune. And people are always threatened when something new comes along, especially if it's something that they can't control. But part of my message here today is, you know, I don't just want to shed negative light 100% on those people because you got you to gotta put yourself back in that time frame. A lot of those things that happen, it's just the way it was back then, you know, and it's been that way for centuries, if not, if not millennia. But, you know, whether you're in a caste system and you're not supposed to talk to somebody that's in a lower caste or no one talks to the lowest caste, the untouchables. We look at that as being so cruel and close-minded and uh, inequitable, unfair. You know, we look at that with such clear eyes in our modern civilized society. But I just wanted to take you back and, and make us all kind of think that people didn't see things in the same way. You know, although it seems crystal clear to us the way things should be, it may seem 100% clear to us it wasn't so clear back then. And it's important that we don't label everyone as evil, you know? 
It's just a part of not knowing. It's a part of ignorance. So I thought about this the other day when I was at home with my wife. And uh, I thought about this the other day. Um, do you guys know what this is? I'm going to show you a picture here. Do you, do you guys know what this is? Air fryer, right? You guys know that's that, that bottom pan to the air fryer, right? It's an air fryer. And that bottom pan comes out. It's kind of the bottom thing that lets the air flow up to it, right? So, you know, I, I used it. I'm, I'm sure I was frying up some chicken wings because, you know, I, I love me some, my chicken wings, my, my frozen Costco chicken wings. So anyway, fried them up and then I washed it. And uh, then, you know, I, I put it into the uh, dish rack and I left it there, okay? And um, and then I walked back over. My computer desk is not too far from the kitchen. You know, I kind of can look at the kitchen from the edge of my computer desk. And sure enough, my wife walked up. She goes, hey, I want to fry something. Um, oh, where's the uh, little thing for the air fryer? Where's that bottom pan part? Now, the funny thing is, she is standing right in the kitchen as she's asking me this question. She's in the kitchen. I'm at my desk at the other end of the room, but I'm looking at her. I'm looking at her standing right in the kitchen, literally, literally a foot and a half away from this very dish rack. As a matter of fact, as I'm looking at her, as I'm looking at her, I see her staring right at it. Okay. I see her staring right at it. Like, I, I can't believe that she can't see it. You know, I, I just can't believe it. And uh, I said, it's right there in the dish rack. What are you talking about? She's looking at me going, where? And I'm like, are you kidding me? Do you not see this giant black tray thing sitting right in front of your eyes? And at this point, I'm almost getting upset. I, I'm thinking that she's actually playing with me, like she's playing games with me or something like that. And so I walked over to the kitchen. I walked over to right where she was standing, literally a foot and a half away. And then in a single moment, I realized what she saw. <laughs> Can you see it? <laughs> Can you even see it? Okay. So from my standpoint, this is what I was looking at. Obviously, look, the big black tray, it's right there, plain as day. You, who couldn't see it? Even a small child could see it, right? But this is what she saw, a tiny, thin barely visible black line. And that really, really hit home for me. I realized that although two people are looking at the exact same thing, depending, depending upon what your perspective is, where you are standing, what your position is, you may see two different things. What was so obvious and so clear to me was not clear and not even visible to her. And until I was able to adjust my position and meet her where she stood, and I know that's literal. I'm literally walking to where she stood and I could see what she saw then and only then could I understand. So we're going to take this literal example and make it figurative and say Instead of physically standing and changing your position, this is what it means. We have to open our minds. We have to open our minds and we have to try to at least recognize that the other side or the other person or the other faction or the other group may not be looking at the same thing we're looking at in the same way. Now, a friend of mine pointed out to me, he goes, however, the air fryer rack clearly was there. So there is a right answer. Because <laughs> I was trying to, I shared the story with my friend, uh, Mike. And I said, well, you know, this is two ways of looking at something. No one is right. No one is wrong. We just have to remember that there are two ways of looking at it. And then in the end, he goes, well, the rack was there. So clearly you were right. <laughs> I go, yeah, yeah. In this particular case, but that's not the point of the story. Because it's not about right or wrong. It's about the ability to see something from the eyes of another human being. And I believe that this is the root cause of so many of the difficulties that we have been facing in our nation. You know, um, so let me play one other uh, video for you really quick. Um, 
And if you've seen it already, don't don't say anything. If you're watching this with somebody else, just just watch it. It's only a little over a minute long. So watch this video and pay close attention. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? The correct answer is 15 passes. But did you see the gorilla? This video is from research by Daniel Simons and Christopher... <laughs> Okay, how many of you have seen that before? I need to see a raise of hands on this one. Okay, how many of you saw that gorilla? I, I know we're on Zoom here, uh, and I'm not even here live, but... Okay, <laughs> so I watched this for the first time, and I did not see the gorilla. As a matter of fact, I thought it was a trick, but I promise you, I assure you, that that video was shown exactly as it was. And when it, we round, it was exactly, there were no tricks. As a matter of fact, this is all pre-recorded. So when you rewatch this Dharma talk later, you can watch that video again from the very beginning. And you will see that that is in fact how it played out. I just think that this was such an amazing thing about the human mind and the human ego um, you knew there was kind of a trick to it, and you thought in your ego, oh, I'm sure a lot of people can't count the number of passes that the white t-shirts do to one another, right? But I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it because I am better than all of those people before me. Where all of those other people failed, I will succeed because I am more uh, perceptive, and I am more aware, and I can see more detail than the average person. <laughs> Right? That's, that plays into it, right? That sense of personal ego. And you are so intent on being better than the past people that couldn't do it that you missed the most obvious thing ever. That giant gorilla. He even beat his chest at one point in the middle. And I fell for it totally. I did not see the single gorilla. As a matter of fact, when the end said there were 15 passes, I was so proud of myself because I counted 15 and I puffed my ego chest out, beaming with my pride, thinking, ha, 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 what a simple test for average human beings. And I passed with flying colors. And then they said, did you see the gorilla? And I felt like such a fool. And that, to me, is kind of what enlightenment feels like. That moment, that aha moment of bow, gotcha. And all the clarity came into view. It wasn't about that at all. It was about the gorilla. It was about not seeing it. So again, this illustrates the same point as I was sharing with you earlier about that air fryer dish rack. When we get so stuck on our way of looking at something, when our ego gets so intertwined in our way of looking at something, we leave no room to see anything else. And this was Shakyamuni Buddha's message to all of us at that time, until this time, and into the future time. Shakyamuni Buddha broke all the molds, right? He broke all of those things, those caste systems. He threw away his title. He threw away his wealth. He threw away everything. And again, as I mentioned to the children before this, he lived the other full extreme. And he realized having living, lived on both sides, being the wealthy in the top and being at the very bottom, he realized that both sides could not see what he was looking for because he was looking for answers. He was looking for truth. He was looking for meaning. Whether he lived on the furthest extreme this way or the furthest extreme this way, 
either side could not see what they were looking for because they were all rooted from their personal viewpoint, from their personal ego stance. And the Buddha finally realized in his enlightenment that there has to be a balance. So to me, again, the important part of the story, I mentioned, yes, that he did share the Dharma with everyone. But another fundamentally important part of this story for me is that enlightenment only came after he nourished his body. Enlightenment did not come from the strict ascetic lifestyle that he mastered for those six long years of fasting, of meditating, of studying, hours upon hours of ritual. But the answer came when he accepted the porridge from the young maiden that came from between the trees, out of nowhere. She saw probably a human suffering. He looked really skinny and he was really sick. He was probably near death. And only in nourishing that body was he able to attain his enlightenment. So again, this is what's happening in our nation today with all of the issues that we are faced with. And obviously I have a stance. I believe in a right thing and a wrong thing. We all agree that Violence against people is wrong. We all agree. That's not the point that we're arguing. But what I am trying to articulate is this. It's important that we understand that these, this ignorance, this hatred, this violence, this racism, all of these things stem from ignorance. And ignorance stems from ego, that clinging to the ego of having only that one view. And I just wanted to illustrate to you how easy it is to get caught up in that ego view. It's very easy. It could happen to any one of us. So this is why I want us to approach these problems with as much strength and compassion as we can. Not, not, not only with anger. Don't get me wrong. We should rise up against violence. Yes, we should be angry about that. This needs to stop. However, the root cause of it, though, is what needs to be addressed. The root cause. The violence is just a symptom of the greater root cause, and that is ignorance. So I believe Shakyamuni Buddha's message to us today would be not only to open our eyes, but we need to make it our mission to open the eyes of others. We need to make them understand of the cultural differences. We, make, we need to make them understand what is happening because they're only looking at it from one way and they don't even see it as a problem. Many people still do not. Just as we did with the Black Lives Matter movement, I learned so much in that time. Of course I knew there was suffering, but I did not fully realize the extent to which that particular community has suffered in this nation. And so that education helped open my eyes. So that's the same challenge we have with, with us, with all minority groups, and not just minority groups, with people of different gender identities and, and sexual uh, identities. These are all groups that are, are disenfranchised, that, are, that have had systemic you know, uh, things that have been held against them. So Shakyamuni Buddha's message to all of us will be to open our eyes, and not only our eyes, but to remember that other people don't have the ability to see things with eyes wide open. So that is our mission. Let us continue to make sure that our voices are heard, that our stories are heard, and that our truth is heard. And this is the best way that we can honor Shakyamuni Buddha on this Hanamatsuri day. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Butsu. Namo Amida Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well on this special Hanamatsuri Day service. On behalf of the temple, I would like to thank our guest speaker, Koichi Misushima, for taking time out of his busy schedule to prepare and present two Dharma messages for our Dharma school students and the other for our adult Sangha. We look forward to a time when he can visit us in person. Thank you to Kenji Sensei for officiating the service today and to Reverend Smitty for chairing and organizing the program. Special thanks to Bill Teague for putting the video together for us to view. 
We are grateful for the beautiful orchids donated by Mrs. Morinaka and her son Ronnie. Almost 40 bunches were wrapped and delivered to our Keto Kai members. Thank you to the delivery team, Linda, our secretary, for receiving the flowers, and to Ralph Honda, Roy, and Karen Okahara for organizing and prepping the orchids. They were enjoyed by all. In closing, we want to give deep gratitude to you, the Sangha, for your generous donations and constant support to the temple. We're closing in on this virus, so please take extra care just a little longer so we can gather soon. Thank you so much. Please join me for music meditation. Shakyamuni Tathagata appeared in this world solely to teach the ocean-like primal vow of Amida Buddha. Gasho, Namo Amida Buddha, 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 Namo Amida Buddha. Everybody, we're back live again. Thank you for joining our virtual Hanamatsuri celebration. In a moment, you'll have an opportunity to join a Zoom breakout room where you can finally unmute yourself and say hello to others who have been attending the service. But before we move to the smaller groups, I'd like to thank Kenji Sensei for officiating the service, uh, Koichi Sensei for his wonderful Dharma messages, and all those who recited chanted, sang, played music, and provided other input to our service. Also, thanks to everyone who shared their beautiful flower photos for the opening slideshow. And I would especially like to express my personal deep gratitude to my Zoom and video crew, Kimberly Cruz and Bill Teague, without whom this virtual Hanamatsuri service would never have happened. So please stay logged into Zoom and join a breakout room for some socializing and an opportunity to greet Dharma friends, both old and new.